Did you know that your talents, traits, hobbies, all these things that you had before you became a follower of Christ can be used in a spiritual manner to fulfill God's purpose in your life? In our lesson today, Jesus tells four fishermen who had not caught anything the night before to cast out their nets once again, but from now on, they will be fishers of people. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Welcome to JCC Sunday School Lesson for January 10th, 2020. The title of this International Sunday School Lesson in Boyd's Commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School Commentary is called to significance. Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. The unifying topic of our lesson today is the ultimate fish story. And our scripture will be coming from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now our main thought will be in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, and we'll be in a New Living Translation of the Bible today. That verse reads, his partners, James and John, sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. Now, the aim of our lesson today is by the end of this lesson, we will contemplate the miraculous catch of fish, reflect on Simon's changing attitude towards Jesus, and hear Jesus' instruction and eagerly obey him. Like we do each week, we'll start our lesson off with a little bit of background. We're in our second part of this unit that's called Jesus and the Calls in His Ministry. In this unit, we're discussing Jesus' calling as a Savior of this world and how He walked in His calling on this earth. Jesus shows us how to walk in our calling along with the importance of proclaiming the gospel and the significance uh, of the role that we play in getting the gospel out to this world. In our lesson today, we'll be coming out of the, Luke, the book of Luke once again. Now we know Luke is an educated physician who lived during the first century. He gives us one of the earliest written accounts of Jesus, yet he makes it clear that he was not a, a, an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry as he walked here on earth. However, as a traveling companion to Paul, he had direct access to the apostles and other accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. He wrote his gospel um, using documentations and accounts from people who were actually there. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, which talks about the walk of the apostles as they go and do similar things as Jesus did in their attempt to spread the gospel throughout the world. The aim of Luke's writing was to show how the story of Jesus actually fulfilled the story of God, the Israelites, and the entire world. Therefore, Luke is an evangelist because his writing proclaimed the good news of Jesus. Now, in our lesson today, we pick up after Jesus leave his hometown in Nazareth, where he taught in a synagogue and performed miracles such as healing the sick. Now, after doing all these things, we found that he get rejected in his hometown to the point that he leaves Nazareth. He then set out towards the Sea of Galilee, healing the sick, along with other miracles that he performed. Jesus' popularity increased and people followed him everywhere. Not so much as they um, look at him as Lord and Savior, but simply because they wanted healing from their sickness because either the doctor could not help them or they were too poor to pay up for a doctor. No, there were also some people that there to hear a good word from the master and rabbi, but many of them was just simply trying to get healed and they knew that Jesus could do so, not fully understanding who exactly he was. Now we start our lesson today in Luke chapter five, verses one and two, and it says, one day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed upon him to listen to a word from God. He noticed two empty boats at the edges of the water, for fishermen had left them there as they were washing their nets. 
Now, the Sea of Galilee, which is also called the Sea of Tiberia, regardless of the name, this is one of the largest bodies of water in Israel. And it was a low-lying um, body of water as well. The only um, sea that was lower than that was the Dead Sea. And we know nothing exists in the Dead Sea. That's not the case with the Sea of Galilee. It was thriving with fish. We find here that Jesus started his ministry in Nazareth and there he was preaching in the synagogue. But now we find Jesus preaching near the shore of Galilee. See, Jesus takes his ministry beyond the four walls of a building and he takes it to the place where everyday people are hanging out doing everyday things. This shows us that when we have the word in us, we don't have to wait to the Sabbath or wait to go to church. We can tell anybody anywhere about somebody who can save anybody regardless of where they came from. Jesus chose at this time to preach at the shoreline. Now, due to so many people wanting something for him, whether it be for the, a word from him or healing or a miracle, they had, uh, it, it was a great cloud, uh, crowd of people around Jesus. And he found that he, it was ineffective for him to continue preaching at that specific location, at that specific part, because of all the people around him. So the scripture tells us there were two boats beside the lake, but no fishermen were in that boat at that time. But because it was morning time, we'll find that these fisher were, they were actually cleaning out their nets from fishing the night before. And after they had finished fishing, so now they would be ready to go home after they finished cleaning out these nets. Now, as we move down to verses three and four, it says, stepping onto one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, his owner, to push it out in the water so he can sit in the boat and teach the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper and let down your net to catch some fish. Now, fishers, they must not have been too far because the first couple of scriptures says that no one was in the boats. But the fact that Jesus could call out to Simon at that point would show us that it must not have been too far from the boat because Jesus, we find, Paul calls out to Simon Paul, the owner of the boat, to push it a little further out in the water so he can continue teaching. Now, the boat that Simon Peter had is a smaller boat, boat that could actually be pulled out of the water onto shore. Now, if he had more money and could afford a bigger ship, he wouldn't be able to pull the boat on shore. What they would do at that time would take their boat and tie it into a pole um, that's in the water to keep it um, tied down. Kind of like you see at some marinas right now. However, Luke's boat, I'm sorry, Simon's boat here was small enough to be pulled uh, um, to shore. Now, we also find here that when Jesus go to Simon uh, to ask him this, they were not strangers to one another. We find in Luke chapter 4, 30, uh, verses 38 through 40, Jesus actually went to Simon's home and healed his mother-in-law from a fever. Once the fever broke, she got up and cooked them some food. So while Simon Peter here was not a follower of Christ at this time, Jesus was not a stranger to him. So here we find that Jesus asked him to push the boat out into the water, um, not to get away from the crowd, but so he can position himself to be able to preach to a larger audience. See, by preaching on the water, Jesus' voice could carry out further. Not to get too deep in this, but water actually, um, sound actually travels faster and further on water. And of course, Jesus knew this when he asked Simon Peter to take him out. So that's why Jesus would tell him it would get on the boat, not running from the crowd, but on the water, his voice would be projected even further. So he have a great spot to actually preach. So there we find right there on that boat, Jesus has his pulpit and he preaches to the crowds. Now come to find out. That's not the only reason that Jesus specifically asked Peter to take him out. He also wanted to show Peter his power um, and see if he choose to be obedient or not. See, after Jesus finished speaking to the crowd, he told Simon to go out further and cast out his net to continue fishing, even though Simon had already wrapped up fishing for today. See, this scripture is an example of what Jesus expects us to do in order to follow him to show us the difference between what we can do on our own and what we can do with Jesus what is with us, Jesus asks, um, asks Simon to go out further. 
Don't just stop here. Go out further. I know you've been fishing all night, but I want you to go out further and cast your net out further. This is what Jesus is asking Simon to do here. In other words, will Simon obey him? Will Simon do what Jesus tell him to do? Well, we'll find out in verses five and six, which says, Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night and didn't catch anything. But if you say so, I'll let this net down again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. Wow. Simon's response, master or rabbi, this response is, is, is one that you have a person that you hold in high esteem. We see here that Simon helped, held Jesus into high esteem and said, master. Simon didn't give Jesus all these excuses that we would give in the common day. See, Jesus is here. All Simon did say he worked all night to, and he didn't catch anything. But if you say so, I'm going to do it. See, they would, here, here's what happened. The fishermen, would they would go fishing at night because if fish would swim deeper during the day, they would be too far below. And they had these hand nets, so they couldn't drop their nets, you know, deep down into the sea. They fish kind of towards the top. So they fish at night in order to catch more fish. But here in the middle of the day, P Jesus is asking Peter to go out deeper and cast his net. And Peter is looking at him and this like, like we would, we've done something a million times and God tell us to go do it again. But Peter says something that is extremely important here. God, Jesus, I've already said what I had to say, but if you say so, I will do it. And that's what he did. But he was a little reluctant at first, but nevertheless, I like the, the um, King James version of it. Instead of saying, if you say so, I'll do it. Like the New Living Translation, King James said, nevertheless, I will do what you ask me to do. That should sound familiar to some of us because when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he allowed himself to be captured and hung on the cross, Jesus said, uh, my father, if it is all possible. Let this cup pass from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. In other words, I will do what you tell me to do, God. It's not about my desire. It's about your desire. Jesus requires us to cast out our net further than we have ever gone before. Not because we want to, but because this is what he requires of us. He requires obedience from us. Now, I know sometimes it seems like, you know, God asks us to do something, uh, but yet we've been down there, that road before. Uh, we've been there and we've done that. But when God has us do something, even if we've done it before, we have to cast out our net and go further. See, our experience may tell us that it's impossible, but when we have God on our side and God has told us to go further, because God is with us, all things are possible. We have to learn to say what, Pat, uh, what um, Peter says here. I, uh, I, I don't know if it's going to work because it didn't work last time, but nevertheless, I will obey you, master. God, I know I've tried to, um, you, to start this business a million times. Nevertheless, God, if you tell me to do, to do it, that I will do. This is how we have to respond when God asks us to do something, respond in obedience. And we find here when Simon Peter respond in obedience, it says the net was overflowing with fish. Why? Because blessings come after obedience. If we want to live in the overflow of our life, we have to obey God. See, that's what faith is. Faith is forsaking all, I will trust him. Sometimes we have to forsake our own thoughts, our own past dealings, and trust God as his word, as his word says. And his word actually says, I know the plan I have for you, one which is to prosper you and not harm you. That's the word that God has for us. So I don't care how many times you've tried it before. If God say do it, we have to trust and believe and be obedient and the blessings will come. See, God desires our obedience as we desire his grace, his mercy, and his blessings. 
Simon Peter now has more than he ever thought he would need with all these fish. So in verse seven, he gets back up. In verse seven, it reads, a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. See, Simon has received an overflowing blessing from God. So he shout out to share it with others. See, blessings that God give us are not meant to stop with us, but they're meant to flow through us to others that need help. The number of fish nearly sunk these boats. Now to picture it for a moment, if Simon decide, uh uh, these all of these for me. Oh, I, I, nobody else is gonna get these blessings. Jesus said it's for me, so I'm gonna keep it all to myself. He would be down there drowning in the Sea of Galilee and all these fish would go back and swim in the environment that they're used to. However, because he chose to share in the overflow, he didn't sink. His boat didn't sink. Neither did the people that he helped boat sink and they made it to shore because when we are obedient to God, God blesses us and in the overflow, we are expected to share with one another. Picture here when you find that when they got to shore with all of these fish, everyone looking at this would know that it was nothing short of a miracle. Number one, they have fish and it's during the day and that's uncommon. They're all fishermen. They know um, when they're supposed to fish and when they're not supposed to fish. So to come up shore with boats that's almost sinking with, because there's so many fish involved in the middle of the day, everyone knew it was nothing short of a miracle. And they caught not just a, a plethora of fish, but a plethora of types of fish. That's important as well, because as we are, um, as Jesus described them as fishermen of people, as, as, as we are evangelists, as we are to tell the people about the, the word of God, we're fishers of people. And the hook, line, and sinker is the good news of Christ. When they got to shore, people were astonished. Likewise, people are astonished when our life changed. When we give our life to God and we just start our, our life start to flourish as we obey God, people are astonished by our life. How can how, they, they look and see how have God blessed you and kept you during these times? We are walking around as miracles. If we had um, received the punishment that we were supposed to receive for our past and for many of us, even our present, we wouldn't be here today. But because God has blessed us and gave us even more than we deserved, all that look at us will be astonished. Now, when they look at us, they may not understand that it wasn't by our might and it wasn't by our power, but by God's spirit. But it just as God has led you, we can lead them. As we obey God and God bless us, we can share with them. And when they ask where it come from, we can point it back to our source. We can point them back to God so they can get to know the God that we know. Now is not the time if we're living in overflow to be selfish with the things that God has blessed us with. Now is not the time to keep our tongues quiet when it comes to the goodness of God. In fact, the opposite is even more important now than ever before as many struggle in the hardships that this pandemic has brought on. Now is the time to share in the overflow, even if our overflow is just that peace that we have in the midst of the storm or the joy that we have in the midst of sadness. Simon teaches us that we need to share in our blessing. And this lesson teaches us also about accepting help. God may have blessed you with a job or to own your own business or to start your own ministry. With such blessing, God may also have um, sent people to help you with this. So we have to learn to accept the help. Learn that, hey, this ministry, we may have started up, but it's God's ministry. This business, we might have started it up and God might have told us, told us to start it up. But if God remains in the mi in middle of it, we need to accept help from others so God's word can spread even further. We know the power of the word of mouth. When we tell somebody about Christ who saved us, that's one more person that can hear the good news and determine whether they want to be saved or not. Simon teaches us here that number one, we need to obey God. 
Number two, when we get this blessing from God, we need to share it with others. And number three, we need to accept help. Otherwise, we're going to go down with the ship as well. As we move down to verses eight and nine, it says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, oh Lord, please leave me. I am such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others that were with him. See, after seeing the blessing that Jesus bestowed upon him, Simon Peter praised Jesus. He recognized that he didn't deserve it, he couldn't have worked for it, and no one could have given it to him. It was nobody that, but Jesus that could have blessed them, him in this amazing way. His reaction showed that he felt that he wasn't worthy of even being in the presence of Jesus based on his past and possibly present sin. But this is why Jesus walked among us. He's our intercessor that makes it possible for our sins to be forgiven and for us to come boldly before the throne of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, one of the tricks of our enemies is to make us feel that we're not worthy of anything, especially blessings. But Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11, if you, though you are evil, know how to um, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? When God blesses us, we are to praise him because we don't deserve it, but it doesn't mean that we're not worthy of it. Now, let me explain. Jesus is worthy of our praise. And when we are obedient to Christ, we're worthy of his presence. We may not deserve it, but we're worthy of it because God said, if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will forgive their sins and free their land. What does that mean in short? When we do what we're supposed to do and obey God and live a life that God requires of us, he's giving us these things because we show that we're worthy of it. What's, been, what, what's great about God is even times when we're not worthy, even times when we're disobedient, he still loves us so much that he still give it to us. So Simon, um, here we find that Simon Peter, Andrew, his partner um, that was on the boat with him, John and his brother James, the brothers of Zebedee, they hauled in this boatload of fish and they were in awe of Jesus. They now recognize that they're in the presence of something special. They won't learn the fullness of Christ until he teach them more. But they know they're in the presence of something special. Someone that's not, not like anything else that had ever been on this earth before. And in the presence of Jesus, they begin to fear. Because uh, they, they had this uh, this mindset, they are in presence of greatness, so they feared of this. But Jesus here is tempting to set their mind at ease as we look at verses 10 and 11, where Jesus said, it says, his partner, James and John, sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Do, uh, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishers, fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. This fish story, along with other stories about fish where Jesus is feeding a multitude with five loaves of bread and two fish, it actually caused early Christians to use fish, a, a, a fish as a symbol of Christianity, a symbol that they follow Christ. Now, later we know it switched to the cross. Like right now, we use the cross to reflect on the fact that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. But back then, they used a fish to represent that because fish was so often um, used by Christ to show his, po um, his power and his anointing at that time. See, in these verses, notice that even though they were all amazed, Jesus, he's speaking directly to Simon Peter. This could mean that Simon Peter must be the leader among them. When the leader, when the followers. See, we can take this to another level. 
See, surveys actually show that when men, the head of their household, when they join the churches, uh, join a church, it's 90% more likely that the wife and children will join the church as well. When the wife is the first one to join the church, then the percentage of the, the man and the children join, it goes down further. It's a little lower percentage that they would join. And when the child is the first one to join, the um, statistics fall tremendously that the mom and dad would join. So why do I say all this? As men, this shows us another reason why we are to be more involved with church. At the head of our house, um, we need to reflect what God wants us to be. And we do that by doing what God wants us to do, working in our ministry, working in the church, and leading the people. And as God lead us, we can lead others to Christ. But here we find Jesus cautions them not to be afraid or fear not. The literal meaning of this in Greek is stop being afraid. It claims, it basically means that Peter had some fear there. Peter was afraid of Jesus in a sense of holding to him, uh, him meaning Christ, to such great awe. But Christ told him to put away that fear. See, God wants us to relate to him on the principle of love and not the principle of cowarding fear. When we are obeying God, we can come boldly to the throne and ask of our father. What, what do we have to, to fear as, as children of God? Now, what we really have to fear if we're not children of God, not if we're the latter, as children of God, we are to obey God and do what God um, tell us to do. And when we're right with God, we can go boldly to the throne and ask of him. See, God has a way of meeting us right where we are. Jesus tell these four fishermen that they will be fishers of men or people. They'll be similar to Christ. They clearly see how many fish Jesus caught, not only in number, but type. And Jesus used this metaphor to let them know that you will go out and catch people in a similar manner. See, this shows us that Jesus was the greatest fisherman of all time, not only in um, just fish as in flopping around and sinking, uh, nearly sinking their boat. But we found here that Jesus started out with four men, which led to 12. Then there was hundreds, thousands and millions throughout the centuries. But just like the fish caught in the net, there will be different types of people caught in the awe of Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile, small or big, tall or short, old or young. When we spread the good news, which is our net, our fishing pole and our hook of Christ, it catches people where they are so they too may know who Christ is and they can decide, do they want to follow Christ or do they want to live apart from Christ? Now, Jesus tell these men that they can do the same as he's doing. See, brothers and sisters, Jesus shows us here that God can use our gifts and talents that we had even before we were saved for the kingdom. God uses us as we are. For example, we know Moses. Moses had this rod as a, as a shepherd, and he used that same rod lifted up in the air to cause the Red Sea to part. It was a miracle by God, but God used Moses' rod to do so. Stand up, David. David was leadership over the flock as a shepherd of the flock. God took that shepherd, that leadership mentality, and made David the first king of the Israelites. Stand up, Paul. Paul was educated in religion before Jesus knocked him off the horse on the road to Damascus. And Paul was able to take this religious education, find out even more about Christ, and be able to tell the Jews that what you heard in the past is true and it all led up to Christ. God calls different people to do different things. God can make use of our talents and skills, which means that we can take these and use it in the kingdom. We can use these gifts to build up the kingdom of God, but it also means that 
We are made to do different things in the Bible. Not everyone can be preachers and teachers and evangelists. Some of us have to be greeters. Some of us have to be the finger while others may be the feet. But as long as we are part of the body, does it really matter what our contribution is as long as we contribute to the body? How can we not contribute when Jesus has done so much for us by giving all that we may have an opportunity to be forgiven for our sins and be one with God. Verses 11 said that when they got to land, they had a new career. They left everything behind and followed Christ. They left their resources to follow the source. And over the next three years, Jesus prepared them and showed them how significant they are to kingdom building. He prepared them to teach the good news to the world and they did so. Peter wrote and and um, and or dictated several books in the New Testament, and John wrote five books in the um, New Testament, including Revelations. Their obedience back then, like our obedience today, will continue to allow the good news of Jesus to be heard by the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson for this week. Don't forget to leave us a comment or a like just to let us know how we're doing each week. So until next week, may God bless you and keep you. May his face um, be upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Goodbye.